we left off kind of talking about earthworms and what we're going to start with is going through different examples of animals and how they breathe. So we did talk about earthworms last time. So um, just to remind you, um, their respiratory surface is their outer skin. And remember the respiratory surface, that's where gas exchange takes place. So that's where you have O2 going in and CO2 coming out, all right? A couple things with that, it always needs to be moist so that this gas exchange happens. We're gonna talk more about that as we kind of continue through. All right, so that was the earthworm that we already did. Here's some fun facts about earthworms. Um, earthworms can be referred to as skin breathers, which always just sounds kind of odd, but I mean, you know, they breathe through their skin, so that works, right? Um, skin breathers have to live in a damp environment, which is why they're usually living in soil, that kind of thing, wet things like that. Um, this prevents their skin from drying. If it dries out, they would suffocate. So it's real important that they actually stay um, in wet soil or something like that. So, you know, if they're on the pavement kind of wiggling around, you want to kind of gently, I guess, shush them back into the grass so they can get back onto the, uh, into the soil so that they don't dry out and die. Um, these animals are generally small and many are long and thin and that helps with gas exchange, you know, having that, that high uh, ratio of respiratory surface to their body. And um, with that, we're gonna get into why this is important. So these shapes provide a high ratio of respiratory surface to body volume, which allows for sufficient gas exchange for all the cells in the body. Now, where else have we seen something like this before where they talk about surface to body volume, surface area? Where have we seen that before? And maybe not us, but with Miss Gas. Cells. Yeah, exactly, with cells. Perfect. I forgot you guys were there. That scared me. But yeah, cells. Exactly. So, some other fun facts about earthworms. Um, earthworms are unable to drown like a human would. Um, they can even survive several days fully underwater, which is interesting. Um, and now soil, I thought this was so fascinating. Soil experts think that earthworms um, surface during rainstorms for migration. So that earthworms migrate. How crazy is that? So like birds migrate, but earthworms, I don't know. It just, I, I saw that and I just was like, that's so fascinating. You never think about earthworm migration, right? But that's what they're doing. Okay, um, so most animals have specialized body parts that promote gas exchange. Um, these structures are highly branched to allow enough gas exchange to support the demands of the animal. And then these are some different organisms. So these are more complicated. So here we have fish and amphibians, they'll have gills. Insects or arth uh, arthropods, they'll have these tracheal systems. And then in tetrapods, which is kind of like, well, well, we're a tetrapod, but it means four kind of like limbs. So they have lungs. And so anything that lives on land and is a tetrapod is gonna have lungs. And this is amphibians, which You'll notice they're in two categories, right? Um, reptiles, birds, mammals, they all have lungs, right? And so like when you think about like humans and you think about other animals, usually you think that like humans are the top of the pyramid, I don't know, or something like they're, they're the highest, they're the most evolved, that kind of thing. But interestingly enough, in the land of lungs and like breathing, we actually are not the most evolved. Can anyone guess what, what organism or what organism group has the most evolved breathing system or lungs? What's that? Gills. Not gills, it's a good guess. Yeah, fish, they're very efficient. Fish are very efficient. So I guess in one way you can kind of consider that. Amphibians? Amphibians are good too, because they do have both, which is pretty versatile, right? So that's pretty good. Maybe my question isn't good because these are all great points. What I was thinking was birds because with birds they have to fly and that takes so much oxygen. Maybe my question should be more like per, you know, per the size of the animal, what's the most efficient use. My idea was just birds because if you thought about it, remember when we were talking about the Himalayas and how we needed oxygen tanks but the birds could just fly over you know, Mount Everest and all that kind of stuff. So that was what I was going for. But you guys brought up some really good points. So that's good. Yeah, I don't know about the tortoise though, but again, yeah, tortoises, maybe. 
All right. So this is our, we talked about earthworms. Now we're going to talk about fish in general. All right. And so if you take a, a look here, there's two colors to kind of like represent what's happening in their respiratory area. And I don't want to say the respiratory surface because the respiratory surface is only the yellow part. All right. But the green part is important as well. So if you kind of think about fish and gills, what you're actually kind of thinking about is their respiratory surface, the gill, all right? And it's underwater. It's great at getting oxygen out of water, which is a difficult thing to do because there's not a lot of oxygen in water. And let's talk about this real quick. So H2O is water, right? And the fish, the fish aren't splitting this in half and taking out this oxygen. That would be really cool but they can't do that. So what they're doing is in the water, there's also gases dissolved in there. So in like, if you had a glass of water and you drank it, you would be drinking some oxygen. There'd be just some oxygen gas dissolved in there. It would pretty, and nitrogen gas, pretty much everything that's in the air gets dissolved in the water as well. So it doesn't really do anything for us, but for the gills, it, it's, it's, most, it's the most important thing. Now, how do we experience this, gases in water? Have you guys, have you ever had anything where there was gas in water? I don't know. Boiling water. Oh, that's a good, that's a good one too. I didn't think about that, boiling water. That's, that's like good. Like soda or carbonated water. Yeah, that's what I was going for because I wouldn't want to drink boiling water, but I was going for like carbonated water or soda. Yeah, you know how it has those little bubbles in it? And then eventually it kind of goes flat, you know? what it's doing there is it's getting rid of all the extra gas that's in there but even when it goes flat there's still some carbon dioxide oxygen in there all right so the fish are, are able to get in there and actually remove that oxygen that's in there which is pretty interesting okay anyway um now you'll notice that this picture here and all the respiratory surfaces they kind of do the same thing the earthworm everything they have carbon dioxide rich blood going near whatever you know air or water whatever has the oxygen and they're dumping out the co2 they're getting rid of the co2 and the o2 is coming in and then they're kind of taking that back to the heart so it can get pumped to the rest of the body so that's kind of the flow with with all of this all right the only thing new here we have is now we're talking about fish so they have gills and they're the first one that has this green. This represents the body surface with little or no role in gas exchange. So, you know, the, this part of the fish, not much gas exchange happening in there. You can actually get some gas exchange happening through your skin and whatnot, but it is not efficient at all, and it just will not give you enough oxygen you need to survive. All right? That's why we need the gills. And in case you didn't know, also, the, um, the fish will open its mouth and water will go in and then it will come out through the gills. So if you've ever seen like a goldfish kind of like just chilling in the, in the tank and doing like the little gill flap thing, what it's doing is it's trying to get new water near there because new water will have more oxygen in there. If it didn't do the little gill flap thing, it would basically drink up all the oxygen or breathe up all the oxygen that's in that area. And then it could suffocate if it didn't move around because there wouldn't be enough oxygen for it. So it would need to kind of, you know, keep on flapping, all right? There's some organisms in the ocean that don't have gill flaps and they have to keep on moving or they'll suffocate. Does anybody know any examples of those? Sharks? Yeah, yeah. sharks. Yeah, exactly. Good, good, good. Yeah, sharks is a good example for that one. Uh, Carson, no, I don't think that, that's how that, that works. But good question. Good question. All right, so that's fish. Now we have arthropods, or you can think, you know, insects, that kind of thing. And with these, they have an exoskeleton, all right? So that's basically everything that you can see is the exoskeleton that doesn't absorb air or oxygen or anything like that real easily. It's, it's pretty much just a solid um, structure. But on the sides of the insect, there are these tiny little holes that allow gas to get in. And they can open and close them. 
But the neat thing about this is they don't have a circulatory system. So the air goes all the way right to each cell in this body, or, or close enough to each of the cells so that it can diffuse through there. So all of this is just going to be air that goes in, and then air that comes back out, and then air that goes in. And it'll, it'll feed, if you want to think of it like that, it'll feed each of the cells oxygen by actually letting the air get right to it, which is pretty fascinating that they have that system. So they're not going to have blood, um, you know, in the kind of same way that we, we think of blood for us. Um, okay, so yellow again is the respiratory surface, and then green represents the exoskeleton where there's not much gas exchange happening in there. All right, any insect related or arthropod breathing related questions with that? No? All right, no problem. And then we have the raccoon. So the raccoon or mammals um, you know, the rest of the body doesn't have much to do with gas exchange, but we have the lungs in here, and that's where gas exchange is going to take place. So this goes out to the mouth, and then in here we have it go to the alveoli, um, which is where gas exchange takes place. And you can see that it's just like the fish. You have deoxygenated blood coming in this area where gas exchange takes place. CO2 is coming out. O2 is going in. This is a moist surface, so when you breathe, you know, you breathe out, you're, you're losing water. And then as we continue on, then it goes back to the rest of the body. And that's very similar to what's happening in the fish, in the earthworm. The only thing that's different is kind of like the structure where that gas exchange is taking place, all right? But once you get to like a respiratory surface, the respiratory surfaces all pretty much do the same thing, all right? Any questions with that? Raccoons. No? All right, cool. 22.3. Okay, so we're going to talk about gills in this part. So we're going to start at gills, and we're going to go through each of the systems throughout this chapter. All right, And then we're going to spend the most time in the human and lungs, because that will help you the most in anatomy. All right, so water... So here's water, right? So in water, there's oxygen, there's carbon dioxide, there's even some nitrogen. All that stuff is just floating around in there, all right? So that's just happening, all right? All right, so water has oxygen gas dissolved in it, and the gills can extract this oxygen gas. So the oxygen does not come, again, from the oxygen in the water. So we're not splitting this apart to get the oxygen out of it, all right? That would be some serious chemistry. That would be like the fish would need like a little electric currents and have to zap it and then a whole, whole different thing. All right, so gills. They're extensions of the body surface, all right? They're part of the fish. They increase the surface to volume ratio and they increase the surface area for gas exchange which we talked about this being important with cells, right? And you guys did this with this cast case when you were talking about cells, how cells can have to be really small so that you have enough oxygen and stuff diffusing into it and then waste products being able to diffuse out of it quick enough because if the cell was too big, it would basically suffocate, all right? So overall, we have oxygen being absorbed, carbon dioxide being released, just like everything else, right? Just like the earthworm, just like us. That's usually the general trend in this chapter is this is happening. And you've seen this before too, right? In Ms. Cascase's class, she probably showed you this exact same picture that I went on Google and I found. And it says, why cells are small and organisms are made up of cells. And it has to do with this whole idea of surface area and volume and the ratio between the two. So if you just have one cell, you can have a total surface area for this one being six. This one is a big cell, its total surface area is 150. The total volume of this is one. The total volume of this is 125. You know, you multiply all the sides together. And then this is the surface area to volume ratio. 
and you want this to be a high number. If it's a high number, that means that the gases can diffuse quicker, all right? So what we have here is when it's a small cell, it's six, which is in this case, relatively a good number, all right? But if you have a big cell, it's gonna be a much smaller number, which means it's gonna take way longer for the gases to diffuse in and out, which is not good. So the answer to this is just have a bunch of tiny cells because what it'll, what it'll do is it'll give you more, more surface area. Total volume stays the same, right? The total, total volume stays the same. But when you divide these two, you'll get a bigger number here. So as long as that number stays big, that's great. You'll have enough oxygen getting to all the cells, all right? So that was the idea behind this, right? And this cast case, I'm sure, went into way more detail and did a better job than me explaining it because that's what she's here for, right? We're going over the cells part of things. So if we just keep this concept in our mind though, it'll help us understand this chapter. Okay, so in a fish, gas exchange is enhanced by two things. Ventilation, that means moving water past the gills. So you either wanna have the fish moving or you wanna have gill covers that flap kind of getting more oxygen, uh, more water in there to give you more oxygen. And then also there's this thing called the countercurrent flow of water and blood. And when you see the word countercurrent, what do you think of? Countercurrent. Yeah, it's good. Something that moves backwards, or in this case, it could also be moving in the opposite direction, all right? So what we have here is the water is flowing past the gills in one direction, and then the blood is actually moving. So if there was a, a red blood cell in here, it would be moving across, going, starting over on the right, and then going to the left. So that's what we would see ha happen here. Now you're, you're probably like, all right, well, how, how can that make such a big difference? I'm glad you asked that question. Let me draw you a picture that'll explain it, all right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do, um, I'm gonna do this drawing, but I'm gonna kind of change it up a little bit. So here we have our oxygenated blood. All right, and then we have, I'm basically going to draw this thing over here. So then we have, let's make it blue. And while I do this, I'm going to explain what all the numbers mean too. All right, so we have fresh new water. I don't like to say the word fresh because this fish could be an, a saltwater fish, right? And if I say fresh water, he might be upset by that or she might be upset by that because I'm, I'm saying that fresh water is better than salt water. I'm not trying to say that. So what I'm trying to say is new water is gonna move uh, into the fish through its mouth and then it's gonna come to the gills and that new water is gonna have 100% of the oxygen possible. So it's gonna have all of this oxygen in there. And so this is gonna be down here, that red blood cell moving in the same direction. And let's say that it's deoxygenated, all right? So it doesn't have a lot of oxygen. So deoxy blood, all right? So it's moving through here. And so let's say that it has 0% oxygen, all right? Now remember, diffusion is going to take place, which means this oxygen that's up here is going to diffuse into this red blood cell, right? All right. So by using math, we can say, all right, so something's going to go from, from like maybe 100, let's say then it goes down to maybe 75. Maybe this one goes up to 25%. All right, so now that's 25%, but it's still going to move down, right? So then maybe it goes down to 50%. And then this one's at 50%. And then it's going to stop diffusing into the blood once it hits 50%, right? Because it's at equilibrium. 
once these are both the same, there's no reason that more oxygen is going to go into the red blood cells. All right. Now, if you take a look at this counter current version of it, this one can actually get up to 80% by having them move in opposite directions. Because what you're doing is this blood doesn't have much oxygen in it. And this water doesn't have much oxygen in it either, but it still has a little bit more than this one. So it'll still put more in here. This one has more, so it'll kind of have, you know, here. And it'll always keep on moving. So this new water is over here. Fresh new water is coming in here. That's going to be at 100%. And this blood is almost done moving through the gills. So it's, it's going to get up to 80%. So it's going to kind of do this thing where you're going to get more oxygen into the blood by having them go in opposite directions. All right. Now it is super confusing and I'm not great at explaining it, but I just have like this feeling like this is just what it like. It just works this way. So if you don't understand that totally cool. All right. And if you have a question, please ask because I'd love to help make it more clear. But what I should really do is find a video online that does a better example than me. Because my drawings are not great. No, you guys are okay? Or you're like, we only have a couple more minutes of class, so you can just say whatever and it's fine. I don't want you to take that approach. But it's understandable. Kayla, you good? You got it? Alright, awesome. Okay, so... Here's some downfalls with gas exchange and water. And this is going to be the last thing that we're going to talk about today. So water can only hold about 3% of the oxygen that's in the air, which means there's way more oxygen in air compared with water. Cold water can hold more oxygen than warm water. So fish that are up in like the Arctic and whatnot, there's going to be more oxygen in the water up there. All right. If you're in the Caribbean, yeah, it's going to be nice and, you know, it's sun and the beaches and all that kind of thing, but there's not going to be quite as much oxygen in the water. Fresh water holds more oxygen than salt water. Turbulent water holds more oxygen than still water. And this one makes the most sense because if you're mixing up your water, right, it's kind of like having a bubbler in a fish tank that's adding more and more oxygen in there. All right. So gas exchange in water has the main benefit of the respiratory surface staying moist. It's never going to dry out. The fish will never dry out as long as it stays in water, right? That, that's, that's one of the benefits of, of it being in there. So what would the worst kind of water be as far as oxygen is concerned? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So warm, salt, still water, right? So you wouldn't want to be a fish in that kind of environment. But there are fish in that environment. They just adapted to it, right? They evolved to be okay with that kind of water, all right? You wouldn't want to take a saltwater fish and put it into fresh water, even though there's more oxygen there. It's going to mess up a whole bunch of things. The osmotic pressure, you know, it's going to, it's going to be very upset because of the salt difference in there. All right. Okay. Let's stop there. Virtual folks, if you have any questions, hang on or email me.